Government servants who are brave men and women doing life-saving work. There is this stereotype of the dusty bureaucrat who doesn't get anything done, and this book uh, prominently describes the problems that need reforming at the State Department. It doesn't give a rosy picture, but it also highlights the way in which that's a misunderstanding, the way in which, in fact, these are not dusty bureaucrats. These are men and women at the front lines of all of our conflicts around the world, screening the dangerous people trying to get into the United States, saving the Americans who are kidnapped or otherwise abused, uh, crafting the high-level deals that hopefully keep our brave servicemen and women out of the line of fire. Secretary of State Tillerson was the last of the great slashers and burners. Is that something that the State Department believes, or you believe, will continue under Mike Pompeo, the new Secretary of State, or is he going to try to rebuild this vital bureaucracy? Rex Tillerson is on the record, uh, like all of the former Secretaries of State, in War on Peace, and he's really as candid as he's ever been before. He says for the first time that he may have just been too inexperienced for this job, that he didn't know how to do budget advocacy, he lays a lot of blame at the feet of the White House. It's a pretty extraordinary set of confessions from him. Um, look, Mike Pompeo is less likely to be out of his depth in precisely the same way because he is a politician and a Washington operator and it's apparent from you know the first uh, rounds of back and forth in his confirmation hearing that he knows how to say the right thing. That said, there was a lot of excitement about the opening salvo of statements from Rex Tillerson too. And while the rhetoric sounds good now, we have to wait and see if Mike Pompeo will pull out of this nosedive as so many career officials hope that he will. So, you, you know, you mentioned so many vital areas being bereft of the correct um, foreign service uh, personnel. I mean, North Korea is one of them, North and South Korea. Mike Pompeo has come back to the United States with the three detained Korean Americans in North Korea. That obviously is a goodwill gesture on the brink of a summit between the two leaders. Where do you think this could lead based on all that you've learned from the State Department and in the wake of President Trump pulling out of the Iran deal? This book confronts in frank terms the prospect of this leader-to-leader -leader meeting on the North Korea issue. There are very legitimate reasons why we have said no as a nation to that kind of meeting before. You really run the risk of legitimizing North Korea as a nuclear power. Uh, history shows us, and a lot of this history of negotiations around North Korea is laid out in War on Peace, uh, the, this is a slippery diplomatic opponent. They lie, they speak out of both sides of their mouths, they don't live up to commitments. And the, the problem, Christian, is not that it's intrinsically wrong to uh, you know, run this as a diplomacy by tweet operation and to saber rattle and to go in there and have the meeting. But all of the experts agree you need a, a core of individuals steeped in the history, knowledgeable about the pressure points and the pitfalls to steer those kinds of conversations. And that is just not happening right now. The, the Iran deal obviously was down to a hard negotiations between John Kerry and Jabal Zarif, his Iranian counterpart. And Kerry uh, basically said, when the deal was signed, he used the occasion to reflect on his service in Vietnam, you write, saying, I learned in war the price that is paid when diplomacy fails. And that is essentially the guts of your book, that the military industrial surveillance complex takes over when diplomacy is on the, on the back foot. And nobody in this book is arguing that the soldiers and spies doing important work to advance American interests uh, aren't needed. But there needs to be a balance. You know, Madeleine Albright is also in this book saying in you know, really incendiary terms, the balance is out of whack. And especially in the years since 9-11, there has been less and less space for diplomats in the room. And you know, the consequences of that are exactly as John Kerry says, we give up opportunities to end and avert war. Do you think that if this deal dies and the Europeans somehow can't manage to save it along with Iran because of U.S. pressure, that we are back to a, what President Obama said, either a nuclear-armed Iran or a much higher likelihood of another war in the Middle East. There is an extraordinarily high risk of that. The Obama administration, and you know, this isn't uh, just partisans, you know, these are top military officials who have, in some cases, survived multiple administrations of both parties, looking at the options on the ground. And tactically, what they concluded was, 
The ability to strike Iran to reduce their nuclear capacity was woefully limited. They can put things underground, they can rebuild, they have the, once they have the technical know-how, they can always, in a few months, get back to where they were, and you're at the very real risk of a perpetual cycle of strikes. This is a very dangerous footing that we put ourselves on. And of course, part of the big issue right now is Syria and America's role there, and the Obama administration, sadly, will be remembered for having failed in Syria. Absolutely. And you use Syria as part part of your case study. Mm -hmm. Syria was one of the many examples of the chaos of not having a concerted unified diplomatic effort with empowered diplomats at the helm. It, on the ground for some time as the Obama White House vacillated and talked about red lines and then didn't react to the crossing of red lines as you know and have done extraordinary reporting on Christian. What was happening in the background was the Pentagon and the CIA were running amok and arming and supporting factions on the ground that often were at each other's throats. It was complete chaos. And I tell the story of, uh, you know, members of those various factions going to American command centers on the ground and, you know, talking to an American official who would say, oh, no, no, I'm with the CIA, not the Pentagon. You got to talk to the other guys. And these are factions fighting each other. This is the chaos that results in the absence of diplomacy. So let's get back to your own story. Because no one can avoid the fact that Ronan Farrow is also embroiled in one of the big Me Too stories of, of, of the last couple of decades. Um, how much of your experience, your writings about your own father, Woody Allen, have informed your zeal on this issue? Uh, only in a very attenuated way, Christian. And, you know, I want to be careful to point that out because uh, this idea that there was some kind of a deeply rooted personal vendetta was, you know, a, an, an attempted weaponization of that happened by Harvey Weinstein. And it, there's just no truth to it. And any journalist that looked at it immediately saw, you know, I was an ambitious reporter on a huge lead and I was dogged as a result. I had only lovely feelings about Harvey Weinstein going into this, you know. Really? Uh, uh, you and I were at many events that he was at together and, you know, it, uh, just polite interactions, nothing but. Um, Members of my family had worked with him in a totally productive and, and so possible So was way. it then risky for you? I mean, your mother's an actress, again, your father's a director, um, as you say, members of your family. Was it risky for you to take on Harvey Weinstein? It, it turned out to be profoundly risky, you know. Um, really, for a time, my television career ended uh, when I refused to stop reporting this uh, story. Um, he made devastating personal threats. Uh, you know, I had... Uh, some unsavory characters following me and staking me out, and um, none of that uh, is uh, at all uh, commensurate with the tremendous trauma that these women, these sources, went through. But it, it was threats? a set of obstacles. What sort of threats? You know, I want to be careful to not become the story, and again, that, that falls into the category of I think that there will be time to look behind the scenes. It was not an easy process, um, and the personal links to it that kept me driven were simply that I had experienced uh, what happens to a family when this devastating issue of sexual violence hits it? It was an emotional understanding of the broad strokes of how important it was to tell these stories. No, it's not a personal feeling about Harvey Weinstein. Indeed, and, and I'm not even suggesting a personal vendetta. I'm suggesting what might motivate and, and, and inform a human being when you're taking on an issue. But particularly, I think you even said to your sister, Dylan, Dylan, really, do you have to keep writing about this stuff? I, I think I had an acute understanding of the conversation we all went through nationally in the United States um, of initially grappling with, why is this worth it? And then over time, reviewing how incredibly well corroborated my sister's story was and hearing her anguish, understanding that as painful as it was to dredge that up, her determination to have those allegations see the light of day was actually a brave and important thing. And uh, certainly that informed my conversations, you know, at some time later with uh, accusers of powerful men that I was reporting on. And then you came out and defended her. So I had to go through a complicated process after my sister insisted on speaking out um, and really review the evidence carefully and then conclude, um, almost grudgingly at first, that this was so serious and so credible that I had an obligation to respond to these questions that I was then besieged with uh, and say, yes, actually, you know, my judgment as a brother, but also as a reporter and an attorney who's reviewed the evidence is this is really serious and she should be hurt. And I did that only one time in a Hollywood Reporter column that they asked me to write. And I, I said yes, because I felt that sense of moral obligation. And since then, you know, she has been more than equipped to raise a very loud voice herself. And you did that 
But that also, I think you write, it sort of empowered or encouraged the women who you then were able to break their story to come to you because they knew that you would be open to their story. Well, I was quite badly attacked and smeared uh, for writing that, you know, and uh, it wasn't particularly convenient for my career, but I, I have no regrets about it. I'm very proud to have been able to support my sister as she did a brave thing, and uh, I do think that for some of the accusers of Harvey Weinstein who did this incredibly courageous act, speaking out about this, and did it at so much personal risk, um, it, it was probably a helpful precedent that they knew I had sp spoken in a forthright way about this issue when so many others refused to. Just this week, as you're promoting this book, you also had another big scoop about the Attorney General of New York. He obviously denies these allegations, but you had women come up and tell you about issues of domestic abuse and violence. Tell me about that one. These are terrifically serious allegations of violence being uh, uh, raised about Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, now former Attorney General since the publication of this story. Um, woman after woman describing uh, the beatings, essentially, uh, slapping, choking, punching. Uh, and, you know, part of his response, Christian, has been to say this was consensual role playing. And indeed, it appears in his sexual activities by the accounts of these women that there was a proclivity for th that kind of violence. But they went to pains to say, this was not role playing that they are raising these allegations about and that they wouldn't have raised the allegations if it was simply that. That this was, um, you know, a, a set of physical attacks that transpired when they were clothed off, often. In one case, uh, with a woman who was simply a, a colleague of his, a professional contact, who he came onto at a party allegedly, and when she rebuffed him, he began, you know, hurling terrible misogynistic epithets and then slapped her in the face multiple times, hard enough to leave a mark. And I looked at that photo um, of that mark afterwards and you know heard all of these stories and looked at medical records and my colleague Jane Mayer and I you know really worked hard to make sure we knew that this was dead to rights and all I can say is these are both serious and very very credible claims and I wonder what you make of the the latest verdict the result in the latest Bill Cosby uh, case and remembering that books have been written about him that never even broached the subject of the sexual abuse that many of these women alleged against him. I mean, this was years ago. You go into that as well. Again, it's part of, I think, what you describe as the conspiracy of silence around powerful actors. And I just mean players, not just theatrical actors. Well, I remember just a few years ago, you know, being on air and uh, interviewing uh, one of Cosby's biographers and um, having fights in the newsroom about whether I could ask about the absence of these allegations in what was supposed to be the definitive biography of Cosby, which obviously has not aged that well. Uh, you know, and there was a lot of pushback. There were a lot of uh, veteran journalists uh, and television producers who just said this is salacious. You know, these women have been discredited. Uh, it's not in the headlines right now. Why would you want to raise that? And we kind of wound up with a compromise where I was allowed to ask one final question about it as a, a kicker to the rest of the interview. Um, but that really illustrated just how hard it was to cover these issues only a few short years ago. So I am so grateful for every reporter that's banged their head against the wall trying to change that culture. And just to end with, with the diplomacy part of this, uh, you also this week revealed Black Cube, the Israeli-based intelligence operation, private, investigation, private investigation arm, had actually been contracted to dig up dirt on Obama administration officials who had entered the Iran nuclear deal. That's right. We were able to expose for the first time that this was this firm black cube. There had been reports that were just beginning to emerge that there was some kind of a campaign by private operatives uh, targeting the proponents of the Iran deal. You know, I've reviewed internal materials uh, that show how those undercover agents were directed. Um, they were using false identities. They were using front companies. Uh, in some cases, the very same front companies that were used to pursue and smear Weinstein's accusers because Black Cube uh, had Weinstein through his attorneys as a client and was doing work on that case too. Here, with respect to the Iran deal, they used the very same tactics, uh, going after people's personal lives, uh, smearing them, looking at whether they'd had extramarital affairs. Uh, this was an all-out campaign to discredit the Iran deal. 
On behalf of who? Well, that remains an outstanding question. Uh, the, the language in these materials, Christian, is very politically targeted. It closely resembles uh, uh, conservative rhetoric, uh, some of it used by people around Trump, uh, linking specific offici officials within the Obama administration, talking about the Obama echo chamber and the influence of Democrats on the media. So there is certainly a political element. Now, I should point out as well, we were not able to document that the direct client involved was a Trump official, as has been speculated. And in fact, uh, at least one source near Black Cube said this was a private client, that there was uh, you know, potentially a, a, a powerful commercial interest uh, that wanted to dismantle this deal in some way. And finally, uh, Richard Holbrook was a mentor to you. He's somebody who I've followed throughout his entire Balkan experience as well. You said once to Hillary Clinton he was like a father to you. What did you get from him personally and professionally? You knew Richard Holbrook well, and he had so much respect for you, um, and he suffered few fools, so that's saying something. Uh, he was a profoundly difficult man, as we all knew. Uh, he had a larger-than-life personality. I see pictures of us together there. Uh, you know, the, the counterpoint to that was as many bridges as he burned, and as sharp as his elbows were, he was the most devoted. Mike decided to be the first NFL player to file a TUE, a therapeutic use exemption for cannabis.